All right, thank you everyone. It's uh, our May 7th Lunch and Learn. Uh, my name is Jamar Garcia. I'm the Vice President of the uh, UC Irvine uh, ICS Alumni Chapter. Um, today's Lunch and Learn is about data privacy. Um, so uh, about the so abstract on today's topic, um, data privacy laws have evolved over the last uh, several decades with different laws being passed in different jurisdictions. Uh, today, our goal is to learn um, and understand how the current state of data privacy laws affect us as individuals and technology practitioners. Uh, today, we have Taylor Bloom, a privacy attorney at Baker and Hostetler. Uh, Taylor, if you can, would love to have you introduce yourself and tell, uh, tell our listeners uh, a little bit about you. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor. It's nice to meet you. I am an associate in Baker Hostetler's Digital Assets and Data Management Group. I specialize in providing privacy compliance help to technology companies, and I am a kind of a day-to-day -day resource for in-house counsel on how to manage privacy risks, compliance risks. Uh, I help advise I, primarily on uh, domestic privacy laws, but also international privacy laws. Uh, until the last few years, we haven't had you know, real domestic privacy laws that impacted most business to consumer facing businesses. And we were mainly focused on the general data protection regulation in the, uh, in the European Union. But now with California Consumer Privacy Act, my focus is more domestic. And as more US laws come about, um, my practice gets even more focused on U.S. privacy versus international, but I, I do cover both sides. Very good. Very good. Yeah, so um, the way we wanted to sort of frame to at least today's discussion was kind of go 50-50. Talk a little bit about sort of the data privacy laws as far as uh, uh, us as individuals and how we operate or, or react or what opportunities we have as individuals to better protect our privacy. But also, as technology practitioners talk about what we need to pay attention to um, in our day-to-day -day jobs as far as uh, how do we change operations, uh, how do we um, uh, uh, design technology to help us better manage um, uh, our customers' um, data so that we can be compliant for data privacy. So we'll touch on those um, kind of first. We'll start with the individual, and then we can talk about the business with also saving time for questions uh, at the end. Um, feel free for anyone to um, jump in. It's a pretty, um, uh, we've got, uh, I wanna say maybe a dozen or so folks on the call. So feel free if you wanna unmute yourselves, if you have a question, um, Taylor, do you mind if people just kind of jump in with questions? No, please do. I would love for this to be interactive. It's really boring when I'm the only one talking. Uh, so I would love questions. I would love for this to be interactive. If I say something and you're like, what are you talking about? I don't know what that means. Jump right in. If you have questions about what I'm saying, please jump in. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, but I would love to kind of engage and talk with you through it. So yeah, please. Awesome. All, more than welcome. Awesome. Sounds good. So, um, and, and if you do have, um, if you are a little shy and don't want to unmute yourself, there is the, the chat box. Feel free to add a question there. Uh, we'll be sure to keep our eyes peeled uh, for any questions that come through and, and we can ask them live. Um, so, I, and I think, uh, so Taylor, I think you had some slides that you wanted to maybe at least frame for us. Uh, I know we've uh, the uh, uh, regulations and I think we can kind of get maybe kicked off with uh, maybe that and then we can start some of our discussions around there. Yes, and I, you know, stop me when I've gone too far. There's a lot of slides I put together, and we'll share sure. these after the presentation. You know, I can go through go through a few slides, see if there's any questions. We can stop and chat about it. You guys just let me know what you would like. But yes, That's I will good. share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So in the US right now, we don't have a comprehensive federal privacy law. We have sectoral privacy laws. So you'll see this timeline on the left here around the types of privacy laws that exist currently. A lot of these, as I said, are sectoral. So HIPAA, about health data, Gramm-Leach-Bliley around financial information, COPPA around children's data. Uh, 
ISO frameworks for security systems. Then you get down to the bottom and that's where I kind of come into play. So the first real law we saw in this area was GDPR. And then the first US based actual framework for a privacy law was CCPA in 2020. And I'll go into more details here, but this just kind of gives you an overview of timeline of US privacy laws. So further expanding upon that, you'll see kind of where we started and it's, it's been years in the making and we still don't have a federal privacy law. Um, I've been saying for years, like that's all we need. We want to have this big patchwork framework of different laws in different regions. But as of right now, this is what we have. So you'll see some of these that came about. You'll see uh, one of the first ones is FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Next up, you'll see TCPA, the California Telephone Consumer Protection Act. You'll see COPPA, as I mentioned before, Children's Online Privacy. We have some more government regulation, privacy law focused ones like the e Government Act, Red Flags Act, and then coming to the more present CCPA. So T Taylor, I guess on that note with, I mean, not having a, a, a federal, like one federal um, law, why do, you, why do you think that is? We have splits along party lines around privacy rights. Um, one of the most controversial aspects that I think tends to still impact our current state privacy laws is a private right of action. So there's a lot of controversy around should consumers have a private right of action for violations of these laws. So currently under CCPA, there is a private right of action, but it's limited to only instances of where there's a data breach. So with a federal privacy law, I think one of the biggest sticking points that we've had is whether there should be an unfettered private right of action and is this just going to bring a huge flood of litigation? And is that going to be the right way to go about this? Um, you know, you want businesses to comply, but you also don't want to make these regulations in place that make it impossible for businesses to comply and put so much risk on them. It's a fine balancing act of, do you allow unfettered litigation? Do you limit it to certain respects? Where do you draw the line there? I think that's been one of our biggest sticking points. Gotcha. So it's almost like kind of, I guess, US culturally, right? There's still... Um, you know, uh, should, you know, should the individuals, you know, should people have, you know, and I, I think the, I guess, right to action is, can we bring suit, right? Just kind mm -hmm. of um, be pretty open to bringing suit. It, it seems like, I, I guess, in at least in Europe, it's, it's very much skewed toward, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say necessarily against business, but just like more for, you know, um, individuals being able to bring suit, right? Yep, and in Europe, we're operating under con, con, like entirely different framework. In Europe, privacy is considered a fundamental human right. Like we think like freedom of speech, the right to privacy is just as fundamental as our right to free speech. It's, a, it's part of their constitution. It's a very, very important part of their day-to-day. -day. And we just have had kind of a different outlook than Europeans have had. Gotcha. Do you see, I guess, like this, this federally, that is that is that a sentiment that's changing or or what, what are your thoughts there on that? We are seeing some change, especially in regards to things that are going on right now. Apple is one of the big players here right now that has taken some significant moves recently to change how people think about privacy. I don't know if anyone has seen some of the recent prompts that are coming up in iOS where you get a prompt in your apps that says, do you want to allow this app to track you across third-party sites and apps? And you now are getting more actual granular controls on, no, I don't want this app to share my data with third parties so that I get targeted ads. Or, yeah, that's fine with me. I'd rather get targeted ads than ads that aren't relevant to me. You're starting to see some big shifts industry-wise of what these rights mean and what rights you should have as a consumer. I feel like on both sides of that argument is, I mean, there's a lot of, I think um, uh, passion around kind of both sides of that equation. I, I almost feel like if we opened it up and people, <laughs> you know, gave their comments, I, I feel like we'd have we'd have a pretty strong debate on that. So um, it, it's interesting how that how that how that is though. A hundred percent. And for some of these apps, you know, they're the reason why you're able to use these apps for free is because they're powered by this ad monetization model. If ads if apps aren't able to be powered by that, what kind of smaller businesses are going to be 
out of business, who's going to be impacted here? There are downstream consequences. Um, and it, it is, it's a fine line of, well, yes, you want, you know, I don't want my data being shared. Well, then you might not get this app for free anymore. Uh, it's, it, there's some consequences back and forth, but there's also considerations of, well, I shouldn't have to condition providing my data in order to use a service. Well, how do they provide the service if they don't have a way to pay for it? And the only way that that service is being provided is from the monetary consideration they get for serving ads within their app. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, I'll keep kind of jumping through these slides, but you know, what is data privacy? You know, it's the right for you to have control over your personal information. Um, it's how it's handled, what rights you have, how companies collect it, how it's stored and what they can do with it. So a good example of how to think about this is what is personal information? Traditionally, personal information used to be thought of as things like your name, your email address, your home address, your, you know, your phone number. But now when you think about it, there's a lot more data that's considered personal information that can get tied to you. One of the big ones is location data. Also things like your browsing history what websites you visit, what things you purchase, all these things are tied back to your identifier, which is your usually what I would call your Android or Apple ID. And these IDs track you across everything you do, everything you purchase, every website you visit, every action you take, it's all tied back to you. It's also tied back to you in things or things you do outside of your computer, things like a purchase you make in a store. Uh, there's beacons that register when you enter a store and that's transmitted back to your device. All these actions are all tied together and they all build into your personal information. So um, Vartan has a, uh, he posted a question that's um, I, I, I think almost like a riff off of this or at least uh, digging into this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, uh, what are the recourses I'm, and if you're getting to this, yeah, I don't, hopefully you can answer it here. Uh, what are the recourses for an individual whose sensitive personal information has been exposed openly without uh, privacy protection? For example, if an employer sends a W-2 via email, uh, clear text, unencrypted, is this a breach of privacy? Um, what recourse is there uh, to report such trans uh, transgressions, even if the individual can't prove uh, harm occurred to, to him or her? In other words, the goal is not to um, win compensation, but to report transgression uh, for the benefit of improving the landscape for everyone. So there are data breach laws in all 50 states. These data breach laws allow for private rights of action. And I'm actually going to go into this in more detail. But yes, there are data breach laws in every state um, that allow for private rights of action, depending on the data that was exposed and who was exposed to. But a lot of that does come down to harm. If there was no harm, it is very difficult to succeed in one of these actions. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Doubling down onto one of these pieces I mentioned, location data. So this is one of my favorite graphics around the world of geolocation data and how location data is collected. Your location and where you go and what you do is very telling. And your device is basically your personal tracker that goes with you everywhere. And it ties all of these location points together. So when you use an app, that app's gonna request permission to get your location. Sometimes you have specific permissions like only allow it while you're using it or allow once or don't allow. Also, there's precise location and there's approximate location. Some of these settings are controllable in your device, some are not. So there's a lot of things to think about here. There's proximity, which is, you know, what general area you're in. And then there's your actual location, which comes down to like your lat long coordinates. Some of this is really helpful things. Like when you place a mobile order for pickup, they want to know when you enter into a geo region so that they can make sure your order's ready when you walk in the door. Some of these things are used for those purposes. Some are used to be able to say, hey, I just saw this person drive by the store. I'm going to serve them an ad and try to get them to enter a location. There's lots of different reasons that go into this, but there's a lot to think about when you think about location data and where it comes into play and where it's collected. So if you look on the right side of the screen, it's really interesting to me to see all the different places where your location data may be being collected. So, you know, cell phone carriers, 
operating systems of your mobile device, all the apps you use, whether it be a Maps app like your Google Maps, you really want them to use your location. But does you know your shopping app, does it need to use your location or is it just helpful for the app to know which location you're most nearby? Um, lots of considerations here and location data can be very sensitive. And it's just something to think about of where does all this come into play? You know, is it just your location pinging off a cell tower? Is it being acquired by satellites? Is it because you walked by another device and you pinged it? Lots of things to think about in regards to geolocation data. This is a really cool kind of graphic that I definitely recommend looking at more closely. Oh, that's great. And, and just for everyone, I know this is a little bit of an eye chart, but we will <laughs> have this available to everyone. We'll send this out so you guys will be able to dig into this um, uh, more, uh, more deeply. Um, Taylor, one question, I know this is maybe um, uh, uh, just, I guess, with recent events, and, and I, I think, it, what is it, AirTag, the, the most recent um, Apple device as far as being able to find stuff. It, it's super interesting because, I mean, talking about and uh, the, I guess, the granularity for how um, of finding, uh, finding things and, and sort of the ramifications of that, like, what are your thoughts on an innovation like that, and it's it's funny because it, maybe the innovation isn't so much that you can find things, much more than it is that um, you can remember that someone was near other things, right? And just as far as how that kind of all comes into play with tracking of that data. It's just one more data element and one more way your data is being collected. That doesn't mean it's not already being collected in all these other ways, just giving you another way to think about hey, every person I pass, that's another way my data is getting collected. My phone's pinging off their phone. All of this connects all of us and all of these are just more data points that build into this you know, giant spatial map that uh, you know, big tech is able to really see into. I mean, some days I feel like I wanna just crawl into a big Faraday bag and some days like, I'm like, oh yeah, let's, let's connect everything. It's, it's, it depends whichever, on which day it is. Yeah, and whichever way you look at it, there's no real way to truly avoid this unless you use a different device and different computer for every single action you take, it's all getting tied back together in one way or the other. Right, right. And it, were, there, were there any questions out there? I think I might've seen some people come off mute. Yes, I, I just wanted to say I, I, uh, I agree with all that. And I have found some uh, w several websites and dozens of YouTube uh, folks who give you directions on your cell phone to tone down all of the tracking. And it's the weight of the, the risk of uh, the value of the free service versus giving up your privacy. So you can set up your phone, depending on what it is, to... Um, dismantle or uh, disengage a lot of the uh, activities that are on and your computer. Cool, thanks, Scott. Yeah. All right, so just diving into a little bit more about these federal privacy laws, quick little overview. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of skim through these so we have more time to go through other things. But as I mentioned, there are some sectoral privacy laws that exist. So. One of the big ones is the Graham Leach Bliley Act, what we call GLBA. This applies to financial institutions that are engaged in financial activities. And what it does is regulate non public personal information. So, this is your financial privacy rights. This is what happens, you know, those notices you get from a bank, those are these notices you get in the mail that are like, here's your rights to privacy in relation to your, you know, your banking or your credit cards. Those are those types of notices. So that's GLBA. The other one to know about is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the FCRA. This was the first federal law that actually regulated the use of personal information in private businesses. Uh, it also gave consumer rights like access and correction. So if your credit report is inaccurate, you have a right to go in, access it, and correct it and submit a request for that. So it was a really important thing that never existed before this. Um, it also created the red flags rule. So red flags rule, you know, it there's it's alerts, notifications, anything around like suspicious activity that's exist that's occurring. Other big sectoral privacy law is HIPAA. So this is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This is the federal law that 
it created a few different rules. So it created the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule, and first enforcement rule. But basically what its purpose was, was to give patients control over the use of their health information. And you know, when you think of sensitive data and privacy, I think health information is one of the things that kind of comes top of mind of, yeah, that is really sensitive data that should have really strict requirements and compliance obligations for the use and handling of it. So it, what it really does is it helps limit the use of your personal health information and tries to reduce the chances that this information is going to get disclosed inadvertently. We actually have a question from David that seems um, pretty pretty relevant yeah. to this. So um, do you, do you, uh, so will we see an industry push toward limiting the amount of unnecessary data being collected? Uh, due to data breach liability issues, such as birth date or address? Um, or will it be necessary to pass uh, more restrictive uh, laws in order to reduce the collection of unnecessary identifying information? I think it's going to be a balance. You know, you want to balance the security risk, but also not overly restrict and burden businesses more. It's always going to be a fine balance here. Uh, what do you use to track users, what do you use as your identifying factor here? You know, you can create a unique identifier like what we do in your mobile apps. And that ad ID, while people think of it as innocuous, that tracks you more than anything else. So you can replace these more obvious identifiers with less obvious ones, but over time they have the same risk and same concerns as any other identifier. Gotcha. Um, another question came in, um, how does privacy work um, in the international space? Um, can companies like Google work around slash circumvent um, U.S. federal laws by using subsidiaries in other countries? Usually they're subject to stricter laws internationally. The U.S., um, us in privacy, we call the U.S. the kind of the wild, wild west of privacy. <laughs> There's not really rules here. Um, the first ones we really had were CCPA. We only have sectoral rules. So um, truly where you see the most restrictions is in the EU, but we also have a whole framework of privacy laws in APAC and also in Latin America now. Brazil was the first of, its, of those countries to truly develop a really strong international privacy law. So honestly, I think if anything, it's the US we have to be worried about. Um, I mean, like that's where we don't have rules and internationally is where they're really getting regulated and where we've seen the most fines is actually out of the EU. But I'm going to go into more of these international laws as well later in this presentation. So great. Um, How does a company mm -hmm. stay compliant with all these laws from all these different jurisdictions, from all these different states, from all these different um, vertical industries? And, and, and I guess it, that's on two levels. Number one, how do we make sure we've got privacy statements and, and terms of use that set the right standards? But number two, how, how do we actually um, manage the data to remain compliant with rules we may not even know exist? It keeps people like me really, really busy. Um, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a lot of job security. It's a constant battle to keep up with everything that's going on. You know, um, I, I used to be able to advise on all the EU laws and most international laws, but as more and more come out, you know, I become more reliant on local council. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard effort, though. We do. We have a huge patchwork of all these different laws. And truly, the only way I think that you can do it is by working with someone who does this day to day every day having them you know, review your privacy policy on a yearly basis, make sure your terms of use has the proper disclosures in place. And it is, it's a, it's a hard effort right now. We need a US privacy law so that we aren't operating in this huge patchwork. But also, even when you are operating internationally, you're gonna have different notices. It's very difficult to have one global notice that covers every region because they're so different. Uh, but it, it's, it's what I do every day. <laughs> So, so I, I'm a consultant. I have one client who has his clients are all over the world and they have members in lots of locations. So which rules apply? The location he's in, the location his client's in, the location his client's users are in? All of them. <laughs> okay. It makes it pretty confusing, <clears throat> but he's subject to the laws where he operates, but also where he's providing services. 
And so if you're providing services in a region, you have to be following the laws of where you're operating. You can't just claim that, well, because I'm here and they're there, I only have to follow the laws where I'm at. If you're offering services to consumers in a location, you need to be compliant with the laws of that location. Okay, so this is a SaaS product. Clients can be anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog and they certainly don't know where the dog is. Oh, we know where you are. We <laughs> okay. definitely know where yeah. you are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, 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 but he's, he's servicing hundreds or thousands of dogs. It's, it's getting regional privacy in place. So you're going to have an approach for Latin America. You're going to have an approach for APAC. You're going to have an EU approach and you're going to have an America's approach. And you basically have to have regional approaches. And you can, in some, way, in some ways, you can try to have a more global approach, but there is differences and nuances region by region. It does make it very difficult. And I think, so Taylor, this is kind of, I mean, when we were doing our prep for this, I mean, you were telling me a story about how, you know, using like a, a, a customer's IP, right? They were, they were, you know, trying to figure out like, let's say they they used to live in California then they moved to Arizona or whatever and and you know so trying to figure out where someone's based based on something like IP that's going to drive something dynamic like okay you know here's the jurisdiction that our customers in what rules are we are we bound to right it's really tough and lots of times the best you can do is go off something like IP address and one of the things i was talking to you about Jamar is these IP addresses aren't perfect and mm -hmm. they change. And there's also IP address routing and there's also signal skew. So sometimes, you know, you're getting an IP address that's getting routed off your closest cellular tower. That's not really where these people are. I saw a client's heat map today where they're seeing um, app downloads and we saw all of them in one city in California. I'm going, that's really weird. Do you think we only have users in one city in the whole entire state? I don't think so, guys. I think that's where the app carrier has its hub and all the traffic is being routed through there. These things aren't perfect. And you see errors like that all the time. And, you know, I literally saw it this morning when I saw a client's heat map and going, guys, let's think about this logically for a second. Do we think every client all lives in one city and we don't have anyone anywhere else in the entire state? No, but that traffic is getting routed through one hub. And so these aren't perfect mediums. Um, but yes, you, you do, you want to be able to recognize where a user is located and different companies take different approaches. It depends on if you get geolocation yourself or does the user tell you their geolocation? Is that necessarily accurate? Do you go off what the user tells you or the location you recognize personally? We deal with this for California a lot because California has its own privacy law. And if a user is in California, you need to be following the California Consumer Privacy Act. However, we see lots of crazy things with signal skew when people live right across the board, right on the border. We might think they're in Nevada. We might think they're in Arizona. We might think they're in Mexico. It's not a perfect, it's not perfect at all. There's lots of errors here. Um, gotcha. Right now, it's just people have to make a, a good faith effort and be able to defend why they made that decision. Gotcha. Uh, one question that's come up. Um, so does the Fourth Amendment protect domestic data slash uh, uh, PI privacy, or personal information privacy? It does to an extent, but we have no law to uh, actually enforce that or regulate it. So yes, but what, how do you do anything about it? Gotcha, so I guess as, as far as, I mean, um, I guess it depends on where you're, you know, who you're suing and where you're going to bring suit, right? Yep. Gotcha. gotcha. Not that not an easy task in any way. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is fascinating, especially like I know we've kind of transitioned from individual over to business, and I and um, I, I'm I'm totally fine with continuing the conversation in that direction because I feel like um, um, there are a lot of questions as far as like how does a company put all the this you know, one, just answer all of these questions and kind of put the frameworks in place to make sure that they're compliant, right? And just like, you know, it's almost like you kind of, you're kind of playing a numbers game where as far as like, where am I, you know, like, uh, where am I uh, less likely to be sued <laughs> and for, for under what conditions? Um, how, how, does a, how does a business think about this? And like, how should, 
an owner operator or or a CTO kind of start to have that decision making process? It's definitely a risk balancing. It's also having a good grasp on your data flows. What data are you collecting for what purposes? Where is it being stored? Who is it being shared with? Why is it being shared? What kind of controls do you have in place? Where are you subject to the most risk? And also thinking about where are these laws in place? So, you know, if you look at this map right here, there's only two states in the U.S. right now that actually have privacy laws. That doesn't mean these rules don't matter elsewhere, but when you're trying to risk balance and try to think about what's your priority, you actually have a legal obligation to provide certain notices and data practices in the state of California. In 2023, that same obligation is going to exist in Virginia. They don't exist in other states. So when you're trying to think about risk balancing and making sure that you are not exposing yourself to unnecessary risk, I, I do think it's important to think about where are you operating, what laws are you subject to, and what is actually feasible for you to do based on the data you collect and how you collect it. You know, it's interesting. It's like the wild, wild west. You think it's easier, but it's almost like it's harder, right? Because now you've got, you've got a terrain that you need to manage and, and figure out each, each jurisdiction, right? I used to think GDPR, like, wow, this is so tough. How are we going to figure this out? We have this huge, you know, global privacy law that operates all throughout the EU and there's so many requirements. And now I look back and go, gosh, what would I do for just clear guidance on what the rules are? <laughs> Because right now, you know, we have different rules in everywhere you are. And in California, we have these rules. In Virginia, we're going to have these rules. But in these other states, it's all in flux. Uh, and half of these bills, you'll see, you know, looking at this map, all these states in gray, we have nothing. But how do you actually operate in compliance when you have a different rule in every single state? Makes it really tough. Makes the need for a federal privacy bill really, really, really important. No, that's, uh, that's really interesting. I mean, like you know, depending on your, you know, your political leaning, and we won't get, we won't, we won't swim in that pool of alligators. No, but yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's 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 a really interesting balance and a really interesting trade off when you think about it, right? It's like, and and as an individual, what sort of um, you know, what do you want? But also as, as an entrepreneur or as a business owner or someone even as a manager working in a company that's got outreach across the United States or internationally, you know, what makes things easier and what makes things, and, and, and granted, I don't think that companies by and large w want to violate people's personal no. privacy, right? It's, but it's, it's, it's a matter of how do we, you know, how do, how do we, how do we balance, right? Right. And, you know, how do you not impede business and make it impossible to operate, but still respect general, you want to respect people's rights and what rights these people have, but you also don't want to put companies out of business. Um, for a lot of clients, I had clients who, you know, operate throughout the U.S. And when CCPA came into effect, they said, we're going to stop operating in California or we're going to stop shipping goods to California because we're not ready to be in compliance with CCPA. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, one question came in. So Taylor, have you seen much enforcement of privacy laws in the courts? It seems like a lot of work uh, to comply with, uh, with these laws um, had to do a lot for CCPA. If uh, nobody's really enforcing them, um, if, or if users don't really care. It's a balance, I'd say. We are starting to see actions. We're not seeing much success with these actions though. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so you, you're you still, there's lawsuits coming. You're still having to hire legal counsel to defend you. But for the most part, businesses are still kind of coming out on top here. And it's not the consumers that are succeeding. Or we, you know, we've seen a few breach actions under CCPA. There's one against Hannah Anderson. It's a children's clothing retailer. I think the payout for each consumer harmed um, it was like 70 cents a consumer. Oh my. So, Got you know, it's out. like, wow, this sounds terrible. But in the long run, it's like they paid $500,000 in fines and each consumer got 70 cents. Did that really solve anything mm. here? Right. right. Uh, but we, yeah, we, we are seeing actions. It's, but it's just starting to ramp up. It, it really is. The other thing we are seeing now in California, which is really getting 
going to be bigger and bigger and keep increasing is now that the attorney general of California has the enforcement authority, we are seeing enforcement actions being brought by the attorney general. And it's none of these have resolved yet, but it's they're starting. Um, my firm's representing and defending a few of them right now. And, you know, these this is just the beginning okay. and more are coming. Um, but for example, in Washington, um, this chart was as of uh, April 12th. Washington is now dead. Um, and the reason this bill, they say, died is because there was a private right of action that existed. And it people deemed that just too risky. You can't have an unfettered private right of action. It's going to harm business too much. So, so what you're saying is that we could we can turn this into a a monthly a monthly discussion where we're talking about the <laughs> the progress. We could just have this uh, have this this uh, this slide up and and just have it evolve month month. Yep. To month and... Yep. <laughs> it's a constant change, and it's a battle to keep up with everything. Um, right now, we we don't know what's going to happen next. Oops. But yes, th and this is another good way to see it is each one of these bills is, is very different. There's similarities, but they're different as well. And so you look at CCPA, you look at Utah, you look at New York, you look each one of these, these rights overlap to an extent, but they're all kind of different too. And so it's gonna be, it's gonna be very interesting over the next few years to see where these all land. Gotcha. Uh, a couple questions. Um, so. For very small community sites, um, what data privacy steps must be taken? Uh, and where are the inflection points uh, where this changes? Um, I'm referring uh, to steps like publishing a privacy policy, GDPR pop-ups, and so on. So a privacy policy is you know, generally required. It's so that you can be transparent to users about what you're doing. The if you're in California, there's specific requirements of what this privacy notice has to state. So, you know, a lot of clients will have a general privacy notice and then they'll have a California notice. So it depends on if you're subject to CCPA or not. And I can go into like what makes you subject. So I'll just tell you real quick. So to be subject to CCPA, there's a few factors. You have to have 25 million or higher in revenue yearly, but that's not limited to California revenue. So if you have 25 million in US revenue and you have three customers in California, you're subject to CCPA. It's really fun when I have like local clients in Ohio who are like, I have three customers in California, fully subject. Wow. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so this is actually a, um, I think you might have touched on this a little bit. So will smaller companies be exempt? Uh, due to the cost of compliance. And it sounds like there's at least, at least well, at least for CP, CCPA, there's a, a revenue requirement, right? There is a revenue requirement. And generally, you know, the risk profile is lower. Yes, it's a best practice to have these kind of transparency and notices in place, but your risk profile and risk of actual enforcement are very, very low. Um, oh, let's see, I was like, I had a slide on this, I swear. Um, here is the slide on what constitutes a business under CCPA. So like I said, uh, global annual revenue in excess of 25 million. And then there's two other factors too. If you annually buy or receive, sell or share um, the personal information of 50,000 or more California consumers, or if you derive 50% or more of your revenue from selling consumers personal information. These are the three thresholds for being subject to the CCPA. Gotcha, okay, good. So, that's, definite that's good clarity. Yeah. Very good. How um, much does indemnification help and where does it perhaps fall short of expectations? In, in what, like in- So, so uh, 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 one of my clients, Again, has, has SaaS product that he sells to a relatively small number of organizations, each of which has hundreds or thousands of users. If they indemnify, is he really protected? Well, okay, so there's two other pieces here. Business to business is an exception under CCPA. You have very limited rights if you're solely operating in a B2B context. 
it's B to C that's subject to all of these requirements. So in his, in his situation, he's a B2B that he's not directly interacting with the consumers, right? They use his software. But they're using it through a business that they directly interact with, right? Yes. Okay. So he's still selling the software directly to the business. So he's operating in a straight B2B context. Okay. So but he's collecting, he is collecting information on behalf of the, his client from all these people. There might be some nuances there to dive into. We okay. can totally talk about it offline. All right. <laughs> All right. So here's some more details on what your obligations are if you are a business under CCPA. And this is a business that is consumer facing. So, you know, you have to provide notice of your data collection practices, the purposes for using this data, who you share it with. You also have to tell consumers what their rights are. What do they get to do with, what can they do and request from you, which we'll go into on the next slide. Um, you also have to have, there's also contractual requirements that you have to have with your vendors. And then you have to fulfill consumer requests and you have to implement reasonable security. These are kind of the key pieces to remember in regards to your CCPA obligations. Uh, one question, um, do you have a sense for the, like what percentage of organizations are in compliance with uh, with CCPA? We don't have a true idea. Um, I would say there's a, a you know, I, I'd say just the clients I interact with, they're all putting forth good faith efforts to be compliant. But I don't think there's anyone that can truly say we're perfectly compliant and we're in, you know, it's when people say, oh yeah, I, we're CCPA compliant. I'm going, well, to what extent? Do you have every single contract in place? Are they fulfilling every single service provider contractual obligation? There's a lot of things that go into this. Um, so I don't think there's any perfect compliance model or any way to really you know, quantify how many people are in compliance or how many are not. I will say there are bigger targets and there are smaller targets. And you know, your big national companies that have huge presence, presence in California and collect large amounts of data those are the bigger targets here who are at higher risk. And I think it's all a risk balancing when you really comes down to it. Gotcha. No, it's interesting because I was looking at Scott's question. He, his follow-up question was, are any organizations in compliance? And I, was, I thought that was a kind of a cheeky question. I was like, oh, maybe that, <laughs> and, you know, like, I guess like, you know, perfect compliance is kind of like a little bit of a pipe dream, right? Yeah. You know, um, I hear people say it all the time, you know, oh, we're, we're GDPR compliant. And I'm like, well, that's great. But if I really dug into this, I'd find things that you are not perfectly it's compliant like we're, with. We're GDPR compliant-ish. Yeah, there's, no, <laughs> there's no perfect here. Right. Um, I think there could be holes pu punched in any of this, but it's, it's these good faith efforts. And that's what you're going to need to be able to defend if you came under regulator scrutiny is these are the efforts we took. These hmm. are the actions we, under, we maintained to ensure that we were in a good position. Um, it's your good faith basis for what you're doing versus doing nothing. Uh, here's an interesting question. From a cost benefit standpoint, how much risk should a company accept for data privacy? It's easy to say until something bad happens. So <laughs> it's easy to say like, oh, well, you know, nothing's happened until you have that breach, until you get that enforcement action. Um, it, it's, it's going to happen someday. It's just a matter of when. Um, it's not an if question. These things are going to happen. It just, we don't know when they're going to happen. So the sooner you can get into a good compliant posture, the better. But, you know, it's, it's hard to risk balance when, well, I think a lot of this is inevitable. It's just depending on when it's going to occur. Gotcha. That just reminds me, it reminds me, I was, I was, listening to, or I was reading um, um, Nassim Taleb and he talks about um, sort of like trying to calculate small risks or small small um, percentages or, you know, like probabilities of something happening. And it's just one of those things that we're just not really good at calculating those in general, right? So risk models can be really sketchy, right? Depending on, uh, you know, or at least can be, can be difficult to really kind of hang your hat on, right? Right. And I'm never going to be the one to say, oh, well, there's no risk here. And mm -hmm. tomorrow you have a data breach. You don't know when these things are going to happen. And um, 
you know, a lot of the times I say, you know, it's not a matter of if you're going to have a breach, it's when you're going to have a breach um, or when you're going to get an enforcement action or when you're going to get a consumer complaint. You don't know when these things are going to happen. That doesn't mean it might not ever happen, but you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, th- and by the way, thanks everyone. I mean, the, the, these questions are great. I'm just doing a quick time check. We've got about 13 minutes left or so um, with our discussion. I think the way it's going is, is really good. So please continue uh, to, to ask, uh, ask away uh, as far as your questions go. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of continuing on with the theme of, um, I guess it's on the business side. Um, um, did you have any other, any other slides or kind of where? Uh, I have a lot as as... more slides. I was like, I'm trying to, I'm like going through these as we're talking about like, which one's <laughs> most important. Um, That's good. You know, some of these ones, this is just, you know, what personal information is covered under the CCPA. It's all the things we've kind of talked about. One thing we haven't talked about is probably biometric information. So things like face scans, fingerprint scans, all those things all come under what is covered under CCPA. Um, we haven't really talked about CPRA. CPRA is the new California privacy law. It becomes effective in 2023. And it was just on our ballot in November, but basically it's similar to CCPA, except it made a few small changes. So these are the new elements that are present in the CPRA. So uh, it, it created a new subset of personal information called sensitive personal information. There's additional consent requirements. There's new things around behavioral advertising, which is basically like the ads you see based on the actions you take. So, you know, your day-to-day ads you see in, you know, you're on Instagram or Facebook and you were just browsing the internet for something and then you get an ad for it. That's behavioral advertising. Um, it also gives new consumer rights. So under the CCPA, you have the right to request that a business delete your personal information subject to certain exception exceptions. Uh, you also have the right to know what information the business collects about you. You can also get a copy of that information. Now under the CPRA, there's a few more rights. So one of those rights is the right to correct your personal information, which does not exist under the CCPA currently, but that is a right that exists under GDPR. So some of these new CPRA elements get us closer to GDPR, which is good in some respects, especially for companies that operate internationally, where you're trying to have a global compliance approach it makes it really difficult when the rights are different by region. So as these rights get closer, it does make compliance easier. I mean, looking at stuff like this, it it makes me, makes me think about how companies need to take, I mean, not only just take like a proactive approach, but almost like design in, you know, into their technology, right? Like we like being able to codify data, you know, to that granularity to be able to include features and capabilities. Maybe that's not like externally visible to to consumers, but at least internal for operations to say, hey, how do we easily go and, you know, correct this or tag it to know how much, you know, what sort of data we have, right? Like that almost seems to me that newer companies should be looking at, tagging this data, categorizing and, and otherwise managing the data more proactively. And I would imagine that established companies kind of have a hard time kind of going back now, right? It's a lot harder to go backwards. We call this concept privacy by design. And so when you're developing a new product or solution or software, you start thinking about privacy before you build. So that all mm. these processes, the data collection, the data management, they're all being built out in context of privacy by design. So if you know you're going to be able to export this data to a consumer, you can't export this data in a raw format that the consumer doesn't know what it means. How do you export this data in a understandable format? And so that goes into your data storage, your data portability implementation. How does that work? And thinking about these things from the beginning make it a lot easier. Um, but yes, you're exactly right on point, Jamar. Like, when this software, when you're thinking about software that was built 10 years ago and none of this was thought about, and then you're trying to go backwards and say, all right, well, now we need these rights to exist. 
it's not just like a simple fix. It's rebuilding your code base. It's starting from scratch in some, in some instances. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm just thinking about how many companies I've worked with where they have a file share <laughs> that's just got stuff, right? It's just all the dark, all the dark data that they have no idea what's in there. And I mean, if you're, if you're a municipality and you get a, you know, a freedom of, you know, a FOIA request, freedom, mm -hmm. freedom of Information Act request, good luck, right? I mean, that, right. that's going to suck up so many resources to try to go back and, and, and try to, you know, call all that together. Right. And think about getting a deletion request where someone goes, all right, I want you to delete all the data you have about me. And you're going, I don't even know where that data exists in our system. Right. I don't even know where to start. Is this just in paper files? Is it just in, you know, is it just in our software systems? Where does that, where do you even start? If you don't know where your data is, it, it makes these things almost impossibility. Um, I think the biggest advice I have, like to start for anyone is data mapping. You need to know mm. what data you have, where it is, and where does that data flow within your systems? How does new data come in? Where do you store it? And then also your data retention periods. Are you maintaining data for 15, 20 years that you don't need? And then an instance of a breach, all of that data is at risk. You know, having a regular data retention schedule where you regularly delete data that is no longer needed, mm. really, really important. No, that's 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 great. And I know I know there's some um, some industry organizations that are really, really good about that. Um, um, Oh, our Arma comes to mind. Amy comes to mind as far as, or, um, at least in industry orgs that are um, kind of deliberate about about um, information management and, and you know those sorts of best practices. So, it, I think it would be good, maybe sort of um, I'm sort of making a mental note just to kind of have a a good listing of these because I feel like we're we're really, I'd say, still pretty early in the game as far as um, um, maturity in in this space and really um in, in how to handle um handle this proactively 100 percent. and i wanted to get to some of these later slides because i think it's kind of relevant to what we're discussing here but this is the 2019 incident response report that we put together of what things happen and all of this comes down to your data security, but it also comes down to how much data do you have? Do you know where it's going? Do you know how it's being protected? Are you, could you be subject to a breach, a phishing incident, all these different things that come into play, but also thinking about it, how much does an incident like this cost? How long does it take to discover one of these? How much risk are you at? What industries are affected? There's a lot of factors to think about here um, that I think are really important when you're thinking about privacy by design, understanding your data flows, understanding where your data is stored, and understanding what can happen in a worst case scenario. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and this is this is in your um in the deck that we'll we'll be able to share with folks. Yep. So yeah, everyone can dive into this deeper. I know there's a lot of data on this slide and there's some really interesting facts here like what are the top five causes? This one I think is super interesting of like mm. an incident response. You know, 38% comes from phishing. But also, 8% comes from a stolen or lost device. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Very cool. So we, we have five minutes. This has been a great discussion. I, I, I did want to get a couple things. So um, I guess just to um, kind of close things out, I'd like you to share maybe some parting words with us and then um, just have some housekeeping items at the end there. So if you can, um, yeah, help, help, help close this out on this topic, Taylor. Yeah, um, so, you know, overall, I'd say some of the most important things to be thinking about are, you know, privacy is an evolving landscape. These rules are changing. The laws are changing. All these things are coming into play. We have two state privacy laws right now in the US. We have a myriad of laws throughout the world globally. We have GDPR. We have LGPD in Brazil. Um, it's a big evolving landscape. But what's most important here and where um, I definitely want to emphasize is all of this comes down to your data. Where is your data flows at? Having an accurate data mapping, understanding where your data goes in between, you know, does it go from your software systems? Where is it stored? Thinking about data retention periods. There's some key elements here that just help you get into a better compliance posture. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot to it. 
But I think the better handle you have on your data and where that data is going and what you do with it, the better position you're going to be in. And that's not just from business, but as a user, um, as an individual, as a consumer, who has your data? Where is it being stored? Are you having secure passwords? Are you, you know, protecting your files? Are you, you know, backing up your systems? Thinking about all these things will protect you better and better, but not just as a business, as a user, as an individual. Um, it's a lot to think about, but it's really important. Great. Thank you so much. And, and Taylor, thank you so much for, for spending time with us and uh, uh, sharing, I mean, the wealth of knowledge that you have. And, and I, I almost feel like, yeah, we're definitely going to want uh, a follow up on this, um, you know, as, as we progress. And then, um, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be sure to send this information out. But again, uh, Taylor, thank you so much. Of um, just to kind of, uh, let me get to a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so just to, I, there we go. I think I'm still audible. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, our next Lunch and Learn, I, I believe is still scheduled. For, it will be the, the, first, um, the first Friday of June. So um, mark your calendars there. I think we've, we've just secured our speaker. So we'll be sending out information there. Um, you can find this recording once it's done on icsanteaters.org. Um, there we also have links to our various uh, social media sites where you'll be able to um, take action and um, ask to have your data um, <laughs> removed or, or have them stop following you uh, <laughs> and, and whatnot. But again, thank you so much. Have a happy... Uh, uh, happy Mother's Day for your mother, uh, for all of you mothers out there, and um, have a great weekend, um, everyone. So thank you. Bye. Bye. Now. Bye.